Hey guys, how you doing today? Uh, it's a beautiful Saturday, a little bit of rain, but you know what? We've got something special for you. Today we're at the Zephyr Hills Military Museum. And this is the home of the 10th Fighter Squadron back in the uh, 1940s. And uh, we're gonna show you around. It's turned into a museum now. It's got a lot of cool stuff. So there's a lot to see, as you can see. Got some really cool airplanes in the background. A lot of things I wanna show you. I wanna thank you for coming along today with us me in Malibu and uh, come and join me as we look around. So this is uh, one of the aircraft that we have out here. This is a Korean conflict era time aircraft. You can see they have out here in the museum. It is super neat, prop driven, Got the fuel tanks. You can come right up to this guys when you come out here to the museum, check it out. Get up close and personal to the interior of that thing. I want to introduce you to uh, Harold. Harold was in the uh, in conflict. He was in the Army then. He's retired. And Harold's one of our volunteers here. He's going to give us a little overview about this aircraft. How are you doing, Harold? Thank you for being doing out with good. us today. Doing good. This is Harold. This aircraft was used in Korea and the Vietnam era primarily as intelligence gathering. It had a crew of two, the pilot and an intelligence person gathering information. And it flew, like I said, in both Korea and Vietnam era. Very nice. We'll just take a quick overview all the way around this beautiful aircraft of yesteryear. And I'm telling you, I am I am obviously geeking out here, guys. You know me. Love everything military, being a former vet, or a current vet, former full-time Army guy. Go Army. Super plane. So intelligence gathering. But it could drop bombs too. It's a war war machine. And that's what they're made for, guys. Beautiful. Alright guys, so we're moving on over here. I want you to see the Jeep. I think Malibu might be checking the tires out. Hey, don't pee on those. This is an old uh, Jeep here, and this, believe it or not, I don't want to age myself. When I was in the Army in Germany, we had some of these. Uh, we didn't mount 50 cows on them. They're mostly they're being the uh, first sergeant, and the colonel, and the generals out to the field. It's one of the most versatile Jeeps. I mean, you know Jeep, guys. Jeeps can go anywhere, do anything, and these things were just just the best. Easy to work on and uh, with the 50 caliber on it, it could be a devastating piece of machinery. Just want to bring that to you, show it to you. And this one's kept in very, very nice shape. Like I said, this looks a lot like ones I had when I was still in the Army. It's a great example. Alright guys, this is a C-53 aircraft and Harold's going to give us a little overview of uh, this particular plane right here. It was coming off the assembly line as an airliner when the war broke out and then it was taken over by the government and classified as C-53. The main difference between them, this and a C-47 is this does not have a cargo deck and also it has one rear door versus two. That is essentially the difference. 
and it was used in the U.S. for training. All right. So that's kind of a piece of unique history as they were short airplanes. They needed more. And uh, this one took the call to duty and uh, they used it for training. And training's a big part of what you have to do. You train to fight and you fight to train. And it's got the uh, 10th symbol on there for the fighter squadron. They're called the Pea Shooters. That's their emblem. They put it on this plane. It's absolutely massive. Dual engine props. And man, they would carry some cargo, parachutist, you name it. She's also out here at the museum. Come by, check it out. And I know this is old Deuce and Half. This is an earlier model. We had them too, but this one's definitely a little bit older. A little bit different setup. I've driven some of these myself. It's tucked underneath the wood. Underneath the plane here. This truck here was used for carrying lots of troops, equipment. All right, guys, and now we're moving to the Navy Whaler. And uh, it was used in the Navy. All stuff back and forth. Bring troops back and forth. You can use it for patrolling the harbors. But they've got one here. Pretty good shape. Nice haul. So anything former military and preserved is a great thing. Gonna come over here towards the museum. They keep the grounds here. It is at the Zephyr Hills Airport. I want you guys to see this little beauty here. I uh, talked to Harold about it. Well, it wasn't known. But if you ask me, this thing looks like one of those subs the Navy SEALs attach to submarines and then go on clandestine missions. To secret places. Never seen one of these before, other than a couple of Navy training films about SEALs, but we're not 100% sure, guys. But uh, somehow one got here at the museum, and I think it's pretty cool. So, I want you to check that out. It's Experimental One, so maybe this is how it all started. I want to bring to you guys' attention here. They do have a, in the memory, and thanks for service and sacrifice to the 10th Fighter Squadron. And you can uh, have a brick donated and helps them out. I thought that was definitely something worth showing you guys. It's on the side here. It's something maybe you might want to contribute to. Bring this out to show you too the uh, memorial is dedicated to those who served the country and those who gave their all to keep us free remember freedom is not free easy to keep very nicely done it's the department of the navy the survivors of pearl harbor daughters put this together so i wanted to share that with you guys it's out here also of course, with every military operation, you got to have a chaplain. A lot of men, women dying during conflicts. This is one of the fields. I think it's a really cool item because 
that's uh, rarely seen on display. So to have something like that is pretty cool. And they have services out there for combat guys in the middle of conflicts on Sundays and whenever they need it. So uh, we're appreciative to the chaplains of the different military branches. These are photos of the 10th Fighter Squadron. They're on display here. And this top display is a Purple Heart. It's donated by the family of Private First Class Wilford Worst. And he was in a Batam Death March. That's a picture of him. And uh, letters from his family, letting him know that he had passed away from that. And uh, it's donated by the family, so I want to give that some special respect there, guys. Like I said, uh, freedom is not free. Paid by the blood of these young soldiers. These are lives. Some models here. The fighter plant used to be here, the 10th Fighter Squadron. They've got some history you can learn about here. I've got some more. More photos. The 10th Fighter Squadron. This is the old air tower. There's a carburetor, one of the airplanes. This is a heated flight suit. Something you don't see too much of. Like a simulation of Kamo or what it would look like. Picked as a young lieutenant. Very caliber M1 rifle. More photos of the fighter squadron, the guys back then. It's just really neat history, guys. Got their dogs. Zephyr Hills in 1943. Zephyr Hills has a lot of local history. Marine Corps uniform. Looks like it was dedicated by the Master Stanley B. Kendrick family. Born December 27th, 1920, died on January 30th, 2012. He graduated from Bushnell High School in 1938 and went in the Marine Corps from 41 to 51. Went to Florida Southern College as a teacher at Zephyr Hills High School. It's pretty cool. Thank you for his service. Nice, really cool rendering. Like Hand-drawn airplane there. Some 
guys. So cut out of the engines, piston. Communication stuff. More military bayonets and pictures of memorabilia. This is starter field. Looks like there's a light colonel, U.S. Army uniform. Bernie Morrison. Look at all those medals. So this is the Korean War Room. Bring in here. And every conflict has a different room. Air Force uniform. CBs and SP with shore police. And it's a morbid thought that we set him aside to die, but we did. That's what we did. There must have been 20 of us, maybe 30 of us on board. And we flew for about an hour and a half, maybe two hours from Agnew to Japan. And when I got to Japan, then I felt, wow. Out of the war zone, and uh, you know, really gonna be okay. Some of the creative money, medals, and they get the stories. Come watch this old radio, check out. The oh. air evacuation came to a close as the Marines prepared to Monroe abandon came there to the entertain the troops. Chinese. The last flight out had room enough to carry letters from the surrounding Marines. And I love the war posters. That was pretty famously known right there. Do more for little. Remember that. Major Colonel Doolittle, top of the bomb. This is a Vietnam War room. And there's Bob Hope. Bob Hope, he uh, entertained the troops. Martha Ray. But this is only part of the problem. The countryside is also infested with thousands of poisonous insects and snakes, including one of the deadliest in the world. Very well put together, this place snake. here. For the number of steps a bite victim can take before These are the uh, food packets, so they call called MREs. And there's a flag jacket. I used to wear one of these when I was in the army on the border. That was one heavy, heavy vest to carry around. Looking for any signs of the elusive Viet Cong. Ronald Doc, Vietnam, 1968. So 113. I used to drive one of those in the army. Field artillery. There's a whole platoon of one one three is out there in the bush. As Brown and his men entered the area, they quickly realized. So these are sea rats. Came in the boxes. I heard they were always a little bit better than the MREs. Network of scouts and sympathizers who alert them to the Americans' presence, allowing them. 
them to choose when and where they want to fight. The best the Americans can do now is destroy any hidden enemy weapons or supplies they can find. I always tell these guys you gotta go slow. You gotta take your time, go do these things. But none of them listen to me. All they want to do is get done and get back in camp. This one guy. Oh, he fine, been out pilot. So long, he knows everything there is to know. This so belonged to Lindsay Tilavina, Major USA. Right slowly. This is a very cool flight suit, flight bag. Immediately seen what we would call a pressure release booby trap. Alright guys, this is a World War II room. It's a little mountain tent. I can tell you a little story about this tent. It's to call it GP Small. It was you and one other soldier. When I was in Germany, we did cold weather winterization training in one of these. And I can tell you, the name cold weather winterization training is exactly what they do. You freeze. They taught you how to maneuver and survive in the cold. And let me tell you, that is not a comfortable feeling when you're out there in one of those. But I've been there, done that. I thought that was really cool to have one of these out here. Here's a shot of the inside of this thing. You're snug as a bug and rug. They were put together real easily also. It's a sled toboggan. It'll tell you training out in the cold. It's got a neat cut out of a Oh, door gunning, machine gun, 50 caliber, nice cut out, the ammo would come out the box, down the belt, into your gun, you had to set your timing on these things, this was called a butterfly trigger, it's a nice cut out. Very well put together. And then they've got uh, all the different uniforms here, probably donated or collected. A bunch of Air Force, Army, a Sergeant Major, Gunny Sergeant, Marines, an Imperial Japanese. Army type winter wool. That's different. Japanese Army tropical combat uniform. A lot of servicemen brought back samurai swords. The conflict. And what do we got here? Star of the show. Malibu has a gunner. Hey, Mally. <laughs> German uniform. World War II. German hand grenades. Very, very cool uniform. See one of these. the old German helmets, different military insignias on the side. Thank you. 
So this is a U.S. Navy room. Oh. I'll take you through here. Now this is a unique story about Charles and Agnes Cleland. There's their wedding photo. And that's them there, their years. And here's a Pearl Harbor survivor. And the story I just learned, which is absolutely amazing, was he was stationed on USS Helena in Pearl Harbor. And this is where the boat was during the attack in Pearl Harbor. Charles was putting the flag out on the front of the ship, just like that. They put the flags out in front of the ship. When they were attacked, he was blown. They hit, uh, Helena took a torpedo hit. He was blown from the front of the ship all the way back to the deck and survived. Still put the flag back up on the front of the ship. And... Uh, had multiple injuries, recovered, went back out on another ship that was sunk, ended up on an island, and was rescued there. So this guy was twice, you know, put in harm's way, nearly killed, and came back to talk about it, Pearl Harbor survivor. Really cool story. Make sure you come and take a look at that in the Navy room when you get a chance. Young sailor, suit, love those navy blues. These are some Pearl Harbor survivors, but I was told there's only one of them left now. do a great job here. It's probably one of the finer museums I've ever seen. There's a famous end of the war picture there. And this is the nurse's quarters. And this is a tribute to the women in uniform. The women that helped out during the war effort. There's a flight nurse picture there. Ladies would rivet the airplanes. On the nurses, outfits, uniforms, I mean. And this is a story I just heard of. I want to share with you guys that actually they had women pilots in World War II. And what they did was when they were bringing the airplanes off the assembly line, actually women pilots would take those to the front and they would fly them from the U.S. overseas or wherever they had to be and deliver those planes and it was female pilots. I never knew that. Pretty cool fact. It's a British uniform. Picture of Bernice B. Falk Hondo, his pilot. Barracks building. We can do it. There's a uniform I've never seen before, and that's a Marine Corps. It looks like a nurse's outfit. The green, really cool. And door, Dordery McEwen. And 
That's the Riveter. Right there. Old radio. Nice touch. So, so much to see here, guys. A really cool museum. Really appreciated the Herald walking through with me on this and giving me some tidbits on everything and everybody. Newspaper. I'm gonna go over here to the older Civil War section. World War One. Trench knife and wooded military ammo boxes back then. Periscope. A lot of trench warfare back then. A lot of nice items been uh, either donated or collected. A little shell. A little tidbit about the shell I never knew. Just learned today from Errol. Is that they actually did some rifling on the barrels and tested this shell out. They had a band on there to get better accuracy on the cannons, which I never knew they did that in the Civil War. But they did. This would be the uniform. Very nicely done. Four star general hat. I want to show you this uh, model ship here that was commissioned. That thing is just beautiful. It was commissioned by Charles McGovern. He was a Pearl Harbor survivor. God bless him. He's passed now, but because of him, we have this model of the USS Phoenix. That's him in his younger days there. So thank you to his family for donating that to the museum. Very nice. Yes, that's Phoenix. The Brooklyn class light cruiser. And this is the 9 11 room. Uh, we all remember 9 11. Kind of close and personal to all of us. Uniforms and looks like Ed Franco, Maxwell Air Force Base, contributed to this. This is him here. If uh, you knew him, you know a story about him. Send me some comments. I'd like to know more about him. Of course, we all remember the attack. What led to all the stuff that 9 11 started off. <clears throat> this is an actual New York Fire Department uh, bunker suit that was donated. Some bills, some of the fallen from 9 11. God bless them all. Thank you for your service. Everybody kind of remember where they were at when that happened. These are all the New York City Fire Department pictures and members who gave a supreme sacrifice 
that day. I mean, just so many brothers and sisters in arms, police, firefighters. It's just a horrific day. Well, we should never forget, guys. It's 9-11. If you forget your history, you're bound to repeat it. So don't forget these brave men and women that day. And if you're watching this video and your family one of the survivors or one of the survivors' uh, spouses, thank you and Leave a comment section about some of your personal names of those that you may have lost that you know. We dedicate uh, this video to them and the loss of them. Thank you to all the folks who gave the uniforms and stag displays here. It's a very important time and day to remember this. Hey guys, I just wanted to close this video off thanking the staff here. Uh, we got Allie, Carson, Harold, and Cliff. What a great group of people. I mean, they've uh, showed me around, made me feel like I was family. Come on out to the Zephyr Hills uh, History Military Museum out here, guys. Take the time to talk to these folks. That, uh, they're all volunteers. Nothing's paid here. This is all coming from the love of their heart. They enjoy doing this, and they love meeting folks like you who are out on adventures. So uh, thank you again for watching the channel today. I hope you enjoy this special segment in this military museum. Thank you, thank you again to these guys and girls. And uh, what can I say? It's just been a great day. Uh, come back, check out another video for Adventures of Malibu and Dad. And until then, get out there and adventure. And thanks for watching. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.